Thank you. And James, can I just confirm that's all live now? Uh, yes, Chairman. Thank you. In that case, we're live and streaming on YouTube. I would like to begin by welcoming those members of the public and press who are joining the live stream of uh, this meeting via the Council's website. Members, you are now aware that uh, you need to keep your video camera switched on for the duration of the meeting and to keep your microphone muted except when I invite you to speak. Please click the raised hand function if you wish to ask a question or comment. There's always a risk that we may run into technical problems. I seem to know that only too well, and uh, I would ask for your patience if we do. Should this occur, I will declare the uh, uh, declare adjournment for a while while the fault is addressed and the public broadcast will be paused. If I am uh, suffering the technical fault, the Vice Chairman, uh, Council of Spoon will take over. If it is not possible to address the fault, the meeting may be adjourned until such a time as it can be reconvened. Can I remind members and officers that all virtual meetings will be recorded and that these will be recordings will be published on the Council's website. So we begin, before I uh, begin uh, with our formal agenda, I will begin with attendance records just to make sure that all members can be heard and can hear uh, myself or the officers' presentations. So to establish this, uh, your presence, I will uh, uh, start by reading out your name and once I do, if you could unmute your microphone and just confirm that you can uh, that you are present. So I will start begin with Councillor Bradman. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Councillor Bradman here. Good morning, Councillor Bradman. Uh, Councillor Dupre. Present. Councillor French. Present. Councillor Gardner. Present. Councillor Gowen. Present. Councillor Hudson. Present. Councillor Scott. Is present. Councillor Wilson. Present. And Councillor Wotherspoon. Present. Great, thank you. And from your responses, I'm sure you can all hear me and I can confirm I'm present. Brilliant, so we now move on to uh, agenda item number one, which is apologies for absence and declarations of interest. And uh, with the Democratic Service uh, Services report, any apologies for absence? Uh, thank you, Chair. Councillor Schuster sent his apologies and Councillor French is attending a substitute today. That's everyone. Thank you very much, and uh, may I welcome you to this meeting, Councillor French. Um, members, do any of you have any disclosable pecuniary interests or non-statutory uh, disclosable interests on the agenda items today? If so, if you could use your raise hand function, and I will just go back to the participants list to check. I see no raised hands, so I'll take that as uh, no disclosable, uh, disclosable pecuniary interests. Chairman. Yes. Silly thing. Can somebody remind me where the raised hand function can be found? Is it on the participant list? Of course. That's right. If you click on the participants list and then at the bottom left hand corner, you should see a raised hand function. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Uh, when we reach an item, uh, the, uh, if sorry, if there was a disposable interest um, and if you find this disposable interest throughout the meeting, then please do uh, make, uh, make myself aware um, at any stage throughout the meeting. Thank you. We move on to the uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 25th of June, and the minutes were separated as uh, sorry, were published separately on the 8th of July and circulated to members and are available via the council website. We are being asked to approve the minutes of the meeting from the 25th of June as a correct record. Can I ask if any members who do not agree with the proposal please use the raised hand function now? Yes, Councillor Scott. You're you're muted, Councillor Scott. Sorry. My, yeah, right. Um, uh, in the minutes, I think that Councillor Hoy has been misquoted. There needs to be a, um, a not um, included in the minutes. I just, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find them again. I had them up and that's why I wasn't speaking. Yeah, if you go to the part where um, Councillor Hoy spoke, um, it says that she did want to call into question. It's reported that she said she did want to call into question the professionalism of the officers. I'm sure that she said she did not wish to call into question. It's in the part, I couldn't see page numbers. So it's in the part just immediately above the, the item that says recommendations. It's in that part of the minutes where, I, now I just can't get them up again, sorry. 
yeah, here it is. Um, it says, Councillor Hoy clarified that the local members should have sight of the draft response before sign off <coughs> and submission to the planning inspectorate. She commented that she did want to challenge the professional advice provided by the officers, but wanted to ensure that all aspects of the application are being considered. I'm sure it's simply that a not has been left out by, you know, it's nobody's fault because she must have said she commented that she did not want to challenge the professional advice provided by the officers, but wanted to ensure that all aspects of the application have been considered. It's in the last but one paragraph above, it was resolved unanimously to A, authorise, et cetera. So I'm just advising that in my view, a not should be incorporated between the word did and the word want. Thank you. Thank you very much. I found it. Yes, uh, indeed. It's um, uh, on the separate pack. I believe it's page five and it's the, uh, you're right. So uh, just before it says it was unanimously, um, resolved unanimously, two paragraphs above. Um, I agree. It looks like we've missed a not on there, which is quite an integral word in that sentence. So thank you very much for pointing that out, Councillor Scott. Um, so with that um, uh, um, uh, amendment to the minutes, uh, and no other indications from members that they wish to speak. I will sign those, uh, I'll take that as unanimous, uh, to sign those minutes at an appropriate time and when I can do so uh, when we're returning back to the office. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we move on to the uh, action log. So the action log members, uh, you've been circulated to the action log. Do uh, any members have any comments or questions they wish to raise on either of the items on our action log. We can use the raise hand function. Good, receiving nothing on those. So we just note those actions and oh. move on. Sorry to interrupt, Sorry, Chair. Yes. Um, can I just uh, draw members' attention to minute action 13? Um, there's been a slight error with this action. Um, it says a briefing note is being prepared for circulation on 3rd of July, 2020. Uh, this is not the case. Uh, instead of a briefing note, I circulated an email on Tuesday providing a bit more information on this action. So this action should now be marked as complete. Thank you very much. Thank you for that update, James. Um, and yes, I do recall you sending through that email with the details. So we can uh, mark that off as complete. Thank you. So we note the action log. Uh, we now move on to agenda item number four. And this is petitions and public questions. I've received no petitions or public questions. So we move straight on to agenda item number five. And agenda item number five is uh, the finance monitoring report. And can I invite Sarah Hayward, the strategic finance manager to introduce this report. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a finance monitoring report as at the end of May, 2020. Um, the report relates to the whole of P&E um, and the shaded lines relate to the budgets which are responsibility of this committee. But I do have to apologise because a handful of the uh, lines have been missed and that will be corrected next time, but I can go through those if you would like. Um, the bottom line for P&E as a whole is a 3.6 million overspend on revenue. And the major contributing factors of this are the COVID related costs or reduced income due to COVID. Um, of which there's 5.2 million on the revenue side, there's also some of COVID costs on the capital side. But offsetting this 5.2 million um, revenue COVID costs is an underspend on waste and a one-off um, contractual adjustment on street lighting. So the net position for um, p and &E as a whole is 3.6 million overspend. Um, this report is being brought to committees rather than just being circulated because you're being asked to consider and propose to general purposes committee the updated capital budgets um, following on from when they were first approved at the um, um, as part of the business plan. So if I, I, I mean I draw your attention to appendix eight of the report which details the proposed capital budget changes and there's three sections within this. The top section de details the carry forwards from last year um, and the underspends were in the detailed in the outturn report. So this is not about changing the overall scheme budgets. This first section is just about rolling forward any underspends from last year. And for your committee, this relates to North Stowe Heritage Centre, the Energy Efficiency Fund, and I should have highlighted also the Waste um, North Cambridge Household Recycling Centre scheme. 
The second section of this table, um, this appendix, relates to rephasing of schemes. Again, it's not about changes to the total scheme cost, it's just about the rephasing over the years. And then the third section details the new funding. That's all I was going to say, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the introduction. And members, do uh, I have one indication. Uh, uh, if you wish to speak, please use the raise hand function. And I'll go first to Councillor Bradman. Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I simply wanted to ask about the waste management figures. Um, we have at various places in the report, but I'm looking at page 13, bottom of page 13 under waste management. It says the tonnage of waste and recyclables collected at the curbside up to the end of April has increased due to the impact of COVID-19. I was trying to work out what's caused that. Is it that people are buying lots of stuff online and then ending up with lots of packaging? Or they've decided that while they're at home, they can turf out their loft? Or have we any idea what, what's causing that increase in packaging or, or the, the, the increase in waste? I actually discussed it with a waste team yesterday and it's a whole host of factors and then we can't actually pin it down um, and it could be because people are working from home so their waste is um, it is home based generated. rather than contractual waste um, trade waste I'm sorry I haven't got any detail on, on for, for you on that okay thank you very much uh, Councillor Dupre, it was an indication to speak, but then it's come down. Is that, is that because the question was asked or um, have I yeah, missed you? It was, it was covered, it's fine. Great, thank you very much. I have no further indication to, for questions or comments on the finance report. Um, that being the case, um, then I will move the uh, item to the vote and we have the recommendations at the start of the report. Um, I will take it as a unanimous support in uh, or vote in favour of the report unless you indicate on the raised hand function now. I see no raised hands, so therefore it's unanimously supported. Thank you very much. So we move on to our next uh, agenda item, which is agenda item number six and the approved grid connection for uh, costs for St Ives Smart Energy Grid and I'll invite Cherie Gregoire, Delivery Manager for the Energy Investment Unit to introduce this report. Thank you, Cherie. Great, thank you, Chair. The St. Ives Smart Energy Grid project is one of a portfolio of clean energy projects being developed on county-owned assets, which combine solar generation and battery storage capacity. In this case, this project's located at the St. Ives Park and Ride. There are three methods of mounting solar modules on a building, ground mounted with a solar farm or mounting modules on carports as above the parking areas, which is what we're doing at the park and ride. The solar project produces enough electricity to cover the site's needs with the ability to sell excess for most of the year. The agreement for the sale of electricity is called a power purchase agreement or PPA. We've been in discussions with two customers uh, next to the site for quite a while. At times of low generation, for instance, the shortest days of the year, the site will need to purchase electricity to keep the park and ride operational. There are two potential ways to accomplish this, through a PPA customer or through a grid connection. This two-way sale and purchase of electricity is only possible through one of the customers. As the commercial negotiations are ongoing, we've chosen not to name them in the paper. I'll refer to them as customer A, the one where, where we're able to have a two-way uh, purchase and sale of electricity. Discussions to date with customer A have been positive with their energy manager recommending to a senior management to proceed. A final decision has not been taken yet and additional internal discussions are scheduled next week before they'll return a decision. Should they approve, the agreement would allow the site to sell to and purchase from them using the connection, their own connection to the electricity grid. This is the preferred option as, as it allows for more revenue potential. However, the paper is seeking approval of an alternative should they decline. This is to work with UK power networks to connect the site to the grid, allowing for both import and export electricity from the site. In that scenario, we would apportion the electricity generated to serve the site needs first, then supply the second PPA customer before exporting any remaining electricity to the grid. While the revenue potential from this alternative is lower, it does allow us to retain ownership and control over the grid connection. 
So with that, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Cherie. And it may, may be worth just noting, and I'm sure members and members of the public have already appreciated, but some of the reason why we believe that there hasn't been a response um, since we met with customer A is because of, in light of COVID and the uh, um, more challenging working environment that the, the company are in. That, so, that's absolutely true. The energy manager in question was furloughed, um, but was able to work on this matter uh, during that period. Thank you very much for confirming that. Uh, so we have a few questions. I will start with Councillor Dupre. Thank you, Chairman. I, I do have a few questions. I'll re restrict myself to questions at the moment. Is that is that correct? That we Thank can... you, yes, that'd be great. Okay. Um, my questions really are firstly about the recommendation itself, because the recommendation is asking us to approve a quote to conduct required works. However, in the report uh, at the bottom of page 47, uh, it talks about a, a delegated approval being sought. I'm not clear whether we are in fact being asked for a delegation to be made or whether we are simply being asked to approve the quote. If we're being asked to approve the quote, then I don't understand paragraph 2.11. If we are being asked to agree a delegation, then I think the recommendation needs to be absolutely clear as to what it is we are delegating and to which officer in conjunction with which member. So that's my first question, um, is about, about the nature of the recommendations themselves. My second question, um, I'm going on now to the, um, the risk here um and the um the mitigation of the risks in particular the risk they're not numbered but it's the third no fourth covid related risk which talks about mhclg reducing staff working on erdf projects um the initial uh risk is three times three the mitigated risk is two times two, with the impact being mitigated down to a two. And I wondered how we, we were expecting to mitigate the, the actual impact. We can mitigate the likelihood by our actions, but I was wondering exactly how we were expecting to mitigate the impact of that particular risk. Um, and the third question is also on the risks. It's the second of the non-COVID related risks, which is talking about the risk of not being able to get hold of the workforce to do the work because they are typically um, non-UK workers. Uh, and the proposed mitigation is where possible hire staff from within the UK. And while that sounds like a very obvious recommendation to make. I was wondering how realistic and practical it was in real life terms and what was proposed to be done to ensure that those staff were going to be available at the point at which we need them because it doesn't seem to me clear that I, while it's an aspiration it doesn't seem to me clear that it's an, an obviously achievable aspiration. Thank you. Okay so yes taking those in turn uh, Councillor Dupre, I think you're right. The, the recommendation probably should be reworded in, in that we're still not in the position um, to know whether or not customer A will be going forward. And so I'd anticipated having more information by this point. So potentially, I think the, the recommendation should be reworded. I think you're absolutely right there. In, so, so then to follow on within your question of who it should be delegated to, Typically, it's it's been done in consultation with the chair and often the CFO when we've looked at looked for delegated authority. I'm happy to, uh, I, I suppose, have any recommendations from yourself or the chair on on that rewording. I think any any reference does need to. I, I suppose talk about the fact that the quote with UKPN is expiring at the end of July and we're using it, frankly, as a bit of a forcing function with our customer A to, to make a decision, um, to be perfectly honest. So I think any rewording may need to refer to that timeline as well. I think uh, in light of your um, 
uh, um, willingness to, to look at the rewording of the recommendation, Sheree, as we continue the debate and comments, if you could perhaps propose some wording along the lines that Councillor Dupre is suggesting that you confirmed would be more appropriate. Um, and if that is a delegation to the, um, maybe, I don't know, that would be uh, the Chief Finance Officer in con consultation with myself or with Steve Cox and, and, and the team, I'm, I'm, whoever it is, if you could have a look at the rewording, propose a new wording for when we come to, to move towards the vote. Uh, but thank you very much for that. And um, there was a second part as well um, around the risks that I don't know if you wish to take up um, an answer now. Thank you. <clears throat> Absolutely. So the question of so the fourth COVID related risk having to do with MHCLG having reduced staff working on the ERDF projects and you commented that we might be able to mitigate on the impact but not the likelihood. I think what I should have done is actually reduced the likelihood um, uh, in the initial risk, uh, mainly because at the point we are right now in the project where the next step that MHCLG would be doing uh, actually won't occur until the land registry process runs its course, uh, actually the impact is, is less impactful um, in terms of a risk. Sorry, I'm not explaining that terribly well. While it, it, it's a problem, it's not an immediate problem, if that makes sense. That makes sense in terms of the likelihood. It doesn't really make sense in terms of the impact because the impact will be the same unless you've got proposals to mitigate the impact, not just the likelihood or when it happens. I think the, the, the uh, I kind of did get a little bit of the uh, uh, explanation on the impact of it right now on the project is lesser because we haven't got to a stage where it becomes an issue. If it was right at the point where we needed the RDF funding to be signed off and we were in the same position, I think the impact would have been increased. And I think that's probably where we were closer to. But because of certain delays, the impact at the minute is probably lesser than what it would have been a sort of more time sensitive situation. So I can kind of see I, I get your point, Councillor Dupre. Um, and I think it's a point well made for us to be careful when we look at the how we mitigate our risks. Um, but I can see that there is a slightly redu reduced impact at the minute, as well as likelihood by our management of it. Cherie, did you want to come on to the other um, risks? Thank you. Yes, the next comment was on the second non-COVID related risk, and this has to do with immigration policy and, and the impact on labour costs during the installation. Yes, uh, the only mitigation we can put in place is, is to hire staff from the UK where possible and where economic the, in order to do that, we'll need to survey what subcontracting companies are available at the time when we come to, to installation. Uh, given, given the disruptions from COVID, some projects have been put on hold. So there is a potential uh, for more UK based firms to be available for installation. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't gone back out to market, of course, because we're, we're not in a position uh, within project development to do so until we get more of a green light from MHCLG. So that's really just uh, my supposition looking at uh, movements in the market at the moment. Thank you. Uh, I think that was all of them. So can we move on to Councillor Wilson? Questions? Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've got a couple of questions related to <coughs> page 47 and in particular around paragraph 2.6. Um, first of all, the 73,000 pounds is described as a provisional quote. Uh, and I just wanted to check that either they have or they haven't visited since the COVID-19 pandemic um, got underway and have updated their quote and it's something similar. Um, but probably more importantly, I would have thought that this should have been an item that could have been covered in a confidential session. Because if we're still having negotiations with customer A, is it right that the council should be putting in the public domain all the costs that it is associated uh, with doing some alternative arrangement? And will the customer A not see this and think, oh, well, in which case I can increase my charge for them to connect through me. That I think is the more important item, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. I think there is a little bit of a hybrid here in that 
if we do too much confidentially, um, then there is no way of us saying to customer A that we, you know, that we're going to look at other avenues. I think doing it very publicly so it makes a clear statement that we don't, um, and let's be very clear, we don't need customer A. It makes the scheme more viable. And yes, we want to work with customer A. And actually, I think um, we are being very belt and braces here because customer A is very, very keen on working with us from the meeting that, uh, that the leader of the council and uh, Cheryl French and Cherie had with customer A. So I think that this is, is us sort of making sure that we're using everything within our armory to, 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 to kind of push the situation. But I don't, I, I certainly didn't fear that this was going to cause a problem with negotiations with that customer. But uh, perhaps Cherie would like to either comment or, or confirm that I've got that correct. Well, in my communication with customer A, I have been pushing for a response and saying, if we, if we don't get affirmation, uh, soon we will have to make alternative arrangements. So I don't suppose this would come as a surprise. They, I haven't apprised them of the details of what the alternative would be. And of course this, this paper would reveal those. That would also uh, be something they would be expecting, I would assume. Thank you. Uh, and on, yes. Um, I've got uh, Cheryl French who wishes also to come in. Cheryl. Sorry, Chairman. I, I, I would also just to address the point about the seventy-five thousand pounds or whatever it was, seventy-three thousand pounds. Or did, was it's Cheryl it's, also yeah. going to add something to my comment? Thank you. I I'll, I'll take Cheryl French uh, first, and then uh, Shri, if you come back on just confirming the seventy-three thousand pounds afterwards. But I'll bring in Cheryl now. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Councillor Schumann. So the putting the figure for the UK Power Network's costs uh, for the connection shouldn't impact any negotiation, Councillor Wilson, because if we have to go down that route of going to connect with UK Power Networks, uh, customer A won't be involved in the project any further. Um, so I don't. I think this is more of a, a leverage issue, as um, Councillor Schumann mentioned. Um, what I was going to suggest while Cherie's coming back on the figure was that uh, we'd want to put in a recommendation which is to delegate to Chief Finance Officer in consultation with the Chair of Committee to progress the UK Power Network connection if Customer A does not come forward in a timely manner. And I think that would be the recommendation that we'd need to put forward. Thank you, Cheryl. That's really helpful um, and that we were in the recommendation. Uh, Cherie, did you wish to come back on the 73,000 and its sort of live nature of whether it's likely to have changed significantly? UKPN has not made uh, a site visit uh, post the providing the quote. I can ask them to do so pending the decision of this, this body. Thank you. And hopefully by the time that you get to the point where you might be asking UK Power Networks to come and do a site visit, Customer A would have signed up and we will have to be able to say that this is no longer required and we can uh, progress as we all hope that we can. Mm -hmm. um, Cheryl, thank you very much for that reword and the recommendation. Can I just check with Councillor Dupre, you're happy with that rewording and that it covers your earlier points? Oh, we appear to have lost Councillor Dupre, it seems. I might just cut in and just say we don't refer to them as Customer A in the paper. So I'm just thinking about how to word that portion uh, so it's clear. Okay. Um, so Cheryl, taking your, your recommendation um, that you previously suggested, um, if we refer to it as um, uh, the PPA customer or the, 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 a way that we can capture that, or should we do have a better suggestion how we could capture who we're referring to without naming them? Oh, Cheryl, I've just noticed you put your hand up, or is that a hangover from last time? Oh, that's a hangover. Okay, great. <clears throat> Chairman, um, Councillor yes, Dupre is now live, so if you wanted to ask her the question that you asked her before, she's up there. Ah, super. We, we, we lost you for a few moments, Councillor Dupre. It was just to check that you're happy with Cheryl's suggested rewording of the recommendation. I'm sorry, yes, my internet dropped out temporarily. Um, yes, I'm, I'm happy with the wording of that, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Wilson? Sorry. Sorry, could you just clarify what Cheryl's recommendation it, it is? Because it, it seemed to be if customer A came back with, and I would have thought it should be an acceptable offer or something similar, 
rather than just customer A agreed that we should connect, we could connect. Yeah. Um, it, we, I think got, that, yeah. There's got to be some form of negotiation <laughs> in this that we wouldn't do it if it wasn't advantageous to us. Yeah, I think that the, the wording would be very much along the lines of, uh, you know, with following successful negotiations, um, as opposed to, you know, us just sort of saying, come to us. So Cheryl, do you have uh, a way of capturing all of those little bits that we've just said, but uh, uh, on your new re recommendation? Um, I haven't uh, updated it. I'm waiting for Cherie to just quickly put forward how we reference the customer, but it was just to go back to the delegation, which was um, putting in, um, if after negotiations, the project cannot proceed with PPA customer, uh, to delegate to the CFO in consultation with the chair of the committee to progress the connection with UK power networks in a timely manner. Does that work for I you? I think that sounds that sounds very clear to me. And Sheree, are you happy to refer to it as the PPA customer? Is that that captures? I might just insert the word preferred, the preferred PPA customer. Preferred PPA customer. Thank you. Uh, James, uh, I've noticed that you've jumped in there. I think you probably <laughs> want the wording one more time uh, so that you can record it for the minutes. Is that correct? Um, if Cheryl, if you want to send me over an email as well, just the exact wording, that'd be very much appreciated. So following this meeting, just for the uh, benefit, to the, uh, benefit of the minutes, um, with the exact wording we sent. But members, are you all content that you uh, have heard what Cheryl French's uh, revised recommendation is? And we know what we're voting on. If you're not, please raise your hand now. Ah, Councillor Dupree. <laughs> yeah, for absolute clarity, I just would like to have it read one more time because we've been inserting words, uh, particularly the word preferred. Um, and I'm not sure whether preferred actually captures it. Are we saying they are actually the preferred of two potential PPA customers at this stage? or simply that it's a preference to go with a PPA customer rather than connect to the grid. I wasn't entirely clear about that. Um, and I think we need also to be sure that we've captured the point about the, the, disc, the negotiation being satisfactory. Um, so if, if I could just have it read once more, I, it would be helpful. Thank you. And just before you do, Cheryl, um, Cherie, can I ask what the addition uh, um, of preferred why, why we wanted to include that? Uh, it's just that the paper refers to two separate power purchase agreement customers, and they're preferred in the sense that we retain access to the grid. Uh, so granted, there, there isn't a great word. Um, is it better to refer to them as the required or the, ne uh, the, the necessary uh, PPA customer? Um, because this is very much about the grid connection. And I know that customer B, for instance, is not linked to the, the UK, um, uh, the, the, the power network. So if we could refer to it as the, the necessary PPA customer. We... Than... Chairman? Councillor Bradman. Thank you. Would it be helpful to actually refer to the link, the grid link in, in the recommendation so that we're clear why they're preferred? I think we may be overcomplicating the match if we start going to the grid link, but let's have a look at the um, uh, the, the wording now with this, uh, the necessary, because I think that's what we're saying. It's the one that we, we've got two, two, two PPA customers. We want to work with both, but one of them is necessary for the UK power network connection. Um, so if we refer to them as the necessary PPA customer, because it's very much about that, what the, the issue of connection. Shall I uh, let's have a look at that wording. Thank you, Cheryl, if you don't mind. Me. So, um, if after negotiation with the necessary customer is not successful, we proceed to delegate the decision to the CFO in, conf in, in consultation with the chair of committee to progress with the UK Power Network's connection in a timely manner. Thank you. I think I've, that seems very clear to me now what we're asking and uh, what we're meaning by that unless again, I have any indication from members that they're not content with that. If you are not content or it's not quite right, then please raise your hand. Good, I'm seeing no raised hands. So we have a new revised recommendation now, thank you. Um, and uh, I've had no comments to the contrary on the paper per se um, and the necessity to do this. Um, and so I will move to the vote uh, with that new recommendation. Um, if any members are not Sorry, James, before I do this sort of unanimous position, are you happy for me to take it as a unanimous vote or do you want me to wish I read out the names? 
There's no dissent, that's fine, you can take it as unanimous. Thank you. Um, so I will move to the vote. And if you are not happy with the revised recommendation, I'd ask you to use your raised hand function. I will go to a formal vote. If not, I will take it as unanimously supported. So please raise your hand now if you're not happy with that revised recommendation. I see no raised hands, so there's no need to go through the formal vote. I'll take it as unanimously supported. Thank you very much, uh, Cherie and, uh, and Cheryl. And uh, we'll move on to our next agenda item, uh, which is agenda item number seven. And back to my papers, there we go. The uh, this is to approve advanced expenditure on the Civic Hub Solar Carport Project. And uh, Cheryl French uh, is going to be introducing this paper, but before I ask Cheryl to, uh, sorry, and I've got Claire Judith Smith, sorry. Uh, but before I do so, uh, this paper has been received on, uh, as a late paper. And I accepted this late paper on the following grounds. The reason for lateness is that the solar carport project must uh, integrate with the Civic Hub Pro Build Programme. And last week it was identified that an opportunity to deliver the solar carport foundations could save the council £200,000 if this work dovetailed with on-site works on the Civic Hub due in July. The reason for urgency is as this spend has not yet been agreed as part of the solar carport project investment grade proposal, a decision was taken on Wednesday morning, the 1st of July, to urgently submit a paper for today's meeting for approval. So that's the reason why we've received this paper late, and I hope members understand that. It's captured in the paper, and I'm sure as the uh, officers take us through, it'll be further explained. Uh, so I'd like to invite Claire Julian Smith, uh, the Programme Manager for the investment, uh, Energy Investment Unit, to introduce the report. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, following on from your comments there, Josh, um, the paper sets out the need for the work to construct um, the foundations for the solar carports um, proposed for the new Civic Hub at Alconbury um, to align with the construction programme for the main build. Um, so from a programming perspective, um, I think it makes sense to get the groundworks for the project done now, um, which will enable the solar carports um, themselves to be installed once the Civic Hub build is complete. Um, and thereby minimizing disruption in, in the car park area. Um, the addition of the solar carports to the, to the main build obviously requires careful management to knit um, those two projects together. Um, and one of our key aims um, is to avoid abortive works and, and associated costs later on. Um, so the intention is to instruct the contractors that are already on site um, to complete the work below ground They've provided quotes for both undertaking the work now um, and also um, compared with retrofitting, um, if you like, the works later on, which equates to a, a £200,000 cost difference. Um, so the paper is seeking approval for the budget to take that work forward um, at, at this time, um, but also an additional um, contingency budget. Um, obviously, that would only be used where necessary, but to manage any unforeseen um, groundworks encountered. Um, so this does mean um, carrying out the work at risk. Um, however, the risks are deemed as relatively low um, and the benefits outweighing those risks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. And before I invite members to speak, um, I'd just like to place on public record um, my thanks to Claire and the team who worked tirelessly on this carport project to bring it in line with the Civic Hub Build Programme um, at, and uh, done so um, at astonishing speed. Um, but that has meant that the, this hasn't followed the normal process of how we would go through an energy uh, project. And that's why we're sort of a little bit cut for horse in some respects with our expenditure and what we're considering today. And I think it incredibly prudent of Claire and the team to put in a contingency so we don't find ourselves in this position again, having to ask for further funds um, if, uh, before we get to a stage of, of putting it back in line, as it were, with going through the normal high, uh, uh, grade, grade proposals, um, investment grade proposals system that we have in place. Uh, I have a couple of speakers already indicated, so I'll first move to Councillor Dupre. Thank you, Chairman. Setting aside, um, because there is now nothing that can be done about it, the decision, uh, wh whether or not the decision to move to Alconbury is actually a sensible one. Um, there are a couple of things I'd like to ask about. The first one is that the paper mages on the, the financial risk of um, going ahead before the investment grade proposal committing this money. And I understand that. But there is a second risk that the report doesn't go 
that doesn't go into as much detail about, although it mentions, which is the planning approval risk. Um, and I'm wondering whether we could hear a little more about that and where that stands and what we are doing to seek to mitigate that and how likely that risk is to materialize and what the effect would be there. Um, and the second thing is it mentions um, challenging ground conditions. And this seems to be yet another project where there are uh, construction project where there are things we weren't expecting. And I know things that we're not expecting do hit us in life, but this seems to hit us with particular regularity. And I was wondering whether we could hear a bit more about those ground conditions, please. Thank you. And just before I bring in uh, Claire, I'm sure your first comment, Councillor Dupre, you weren't suggesting we would stay in, now the new Energy and Sustainability Committee, stay in, in Shire Hall, which has a terrible energy rating, because uh, now you're sat in this committee, I'm sure you'd appreciate a much more efficient and effective building that's going to be saving the planet in carbon emissions. Um, I, I, I can see you almost and want to respond to that, Councillor Dupre, but... Um, anyway, I will move on just before we do to the uh, the other point first, so that's the planning and the ground conditions. Um, I, before I ask Claire to respond about the planning, I know that some of the uh, discussions in pre-planning are often commercially sensitive, and I didn't know whether we were going to be challenged with regard to confidentiality. So just to preempt your comments, that, that um, I, don't, I can't see why they'd be particularly sensitive. They are our pre-application discussions, but um, I just wanted to flag that up before you launched into any pre-application um, uh, discussions we ha we've had. Did you want to come in at that point? Sorry, Claire. Yes, yeah. So in terms of in terms of planning, um, we have um, held a, a pre-app meeting, which involved planners um, from CCC and and HDC. Um, the proposal um, for for the solar carports was received positively, um, and we have now received our, our written feedback also, um, which details um, three pieces of key feedback really. Um, one of which was um, that we we should ensure that the um, structures um, of the solar carports are, are matched in, in colour with the building, um, that um, the uh, landscaping should be looked at, because obviously we're proposing to cover um, uh, areas which would have been in sunlight with um, shading from, from the panels. Um, so we will engage with um, the landscape architect that was used for the main build to, to address that. Um, and we've, we've made some consideration to uh, the layout of the car park. Um, that was a suggestion. Um, it's not really feasible given um, the late stage um, that, that we're asking for this to be done. Um, but um, we have discussed that. And, um, sorry. <laughs> Um, and that that um, isn't isn't by any means a, a, a deal breaker. So I, I think the planning risk in total is is um, considered relatively low. Um, in terms of, are you ready to move on to the ground conditions? Is that okay? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that'd be great. So in terms of the ground conditions, obviously <clears throat> coming in um, at a later date. Um, there's already been surveys done um, on the grounds um, in terms of the main build. So we're in a, a, a better position really that we, we have a greater understanding that we didn't embark on um, sort of standard foundations that we've used um, in um, our other, some of our other energy investment projects and then um, found out later along the line that, that actually that wasn't going to be appropriate, that we would have to change the design. Um, so whilst the costs are greater than we had anticipated because we have done similar projects or are developing similar projects and, and got cost um, for comparison, um, we haven't been caught out later down the line. Thank you very much. And I think that's really what's, I mean, certainly helpful, um, although we don't want to preempt any planning decision, is that the comments around us making sure the colours match the building and that we rethink about the landscape suggests there's nothing fundamentally wrong sure. with us uh, yeah. installing a, a solar carport. So that's a, yeah. a, a hopefully mitigate some of that risk. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Next, I have uh, Councillor Gareth, uh, Graham Wilson. Sorry, Thanks, Chair. I, I wanted to ask a question related to paragraph 4.3 and the sizing of the solar carport. And whilst I think this is an excellent idea and ideally should have been 
designed as part of the original build, um, it makes sense to do it now. But what it says is the connection risk is mitigated by si sizing the solar carport to avoid significant export to the grid. Well, that, that seems to me to imply that we're building it smaller than we could do, and we're not getting the as big a benefits as we could. And shouldn't we be sizing the carport to maximize the benefit cost ratio, which might include exporting more to the grid than is implied by here, which is limited? So um, we're constrained by the grid network, I'm afraid. Um, which means that um, we know that, they're, that, that the grid is constrained in that area and there, would, that there is unlikely to be um, capacity to enable us to export. Um, we haven't gone through the formal application process yet with um, the distribution network operator, but, but that is our, our, our feedback at this time. Um, and therefore we don't want, we didn't want to design a, a system um, that was over, obviously over that capacity. Um, Thank well, you, I hear, I hear what you're saying, but that seems strange when we're building on a, a brand new site, which I would have thought would have been built to accommodate this sort of, exactly this sort of development. And <laughs> that the size of the electricity connections should <clears throat> be suitable for on-site generation as well as importing from outside the area. I think if I may, Councillor Wilson, this is the, the, the distribution network is much larger than just the Alconbury Weald uh, area. And um, what, we're, what uh, Claire is saying is that far from being um, making the scheme more viable by increasing the capacity, uh, it suddenly makes it less viable because if we have to pay a substantial grid connection charge, which is what happens when you often try to export energy, um, it can make the it can make the, the scheme inclusive in, in its financial viability. So um, I, I've noticed Cheryl's indicated to speak, but um, I, uh, if you could, if you don't mind Cheryl, I don't know if it's on this point, but if you could try and cover Councillor Wilson's point um, about the connection, that'd be helpful. Um, yes, it was about uh, the um, cost. So if, if you want to export electricity and it triggers an upgrade on the distribution network, Councillor Wilson, and you can then be subject to some significant costs for upgrading the distribution network. And that would probably take the business case into a position that it doesn't pay back within a 20 year timeline and it might never pay back. So um, I think the sensible uh, option here at the moment is that you look at what the demand on the site is going to be and you try to maximize <coughs> the position delivering as much of the electricity for that site, including EV charging uh, within your um, project um, proposal um, and you limit the amount that you export. Because otherwise you could be subject to somewhere up to two million pound costs just on an upgrade. Thank okay. you. And, and we've, we found that, sorry, Councillor, but the show just confirmed, we found that in some of our uh, energy uh, school energy projects one in particular I think that sticks in my mind where we were recommending a, a relatively small um, renewable element but it would have triggered a very substantial grid upgrade that would be necessary just to take that small um, capacity. Okay and Cheryl uh, referred to a lot to you could trigger and it might cause co cost do we, do we know for certain that that is the case or we just suspect it might be because this just seems to me to be a an easy way out to get something which is just about big enough to um, provide electricity to the site without really thinking of the wider opportunities that might be there if we knew the costs and benefits of a bigger exporting opportunity. Claire or Cheryl, who wishes to take this, that was that question. Claire, do you want to start first and then I'll add on to it? Uh, yeah, have you sure. Yeah, so, so the feedback from um, Buigs, the engineers who are um, designing the scheme, um, that's, that's their, um, the initial feedback that they've had from, from the distribution network operator, um, and, and they're, they're aware of those constraints um, on, on the existing infrastructure, um, and, and have therefore sized um, the solar carports um, accordingly. Thank you very much, that's really helpful. Um, and uh, that's uh, 
you know, it's, it's, it, there is a process if we went and decided to go down to sort of really bottom out the capacity and things. But I think if the indication is that we need to do an, a, an upgrade to the network, then it really would make the scheme unless we started making the scheme of scale where we talk about, you know, the solar projects in, in Soham and other areas where we talk about acres and acres of land. It just makes it impossible to, to, to justify the, the network upgrades that are necessary. Um, I d unless, shall you wish to come, comment further? No, that's fine. Thank you very much. We'll bring in Councillor Scott. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, just two points. I don't want to belabor the Alconbury point that was raised earlier, but I would like to have it put on record that Labour's position is that we do not agree with the move to Alconbury, and I would like that to be recorded because I would also like to draw to attention if people are, are not aware that the um, mayor of the combined authority has withdrawn from Alconbury and doesn't see it as a um, suitable site and is looking elsewhere and perhaps um, the discussion about this this issue it does seem to reveal and it's no reflection on the officers at all that the decision to move from Shire Hall was really taken with very little, if any, uh, reflection on or investigation of real alternatives. And I think that this keeps coming up in terms of where the staff are going, in terms of alternative um, accommodation, uh, such as the Roger Asham site and so on. But I won't belabor that point, except to say that I would like it to be recorded in the minutes that Labor does have a an issue with Alconbury. But the point that I, I did also want to raise is that I read the equalities assessment and the equalities assessment says that there are no implications in this and the way that it's being constructed in terms of any of the protected characteristics. And I just wonder if some comment could be made to assure us of that in relation to um, particularly persons with a disability and the way that this is being constructed. Thank you. Thank you. Before I bring in Claire who answered that question around uh, disability and potential access, I guess, um, that may be made more difficult by the carport. I just couldn't, uh, I don't wish to open debate about Alconbury and the Civic Hub. That's not, this is not the right forum to do so, but I can't accept the comment, Councillor Scott, that, we, that there was little or no consideration of alternatives um, when we chose Alconbury. Um, and I'm sure there are other councillors who will remember the, the very in-depth analysis of the, the air, all of the county that we carried out in to try and find the right location for a new Civic Hub and the huge piece of work around the CAMS 2020 spokes. But as I said, there's not the right forum for us to, to discuss that. Uh, perhaps Claire could try and uh, uh, address the issue around disability and the potential that carport may have some impact on people um, with disabilities, physical disabilities. Sure, so um, it would have been helpful, I guess, to, <laughs> to have included a, a plan in the, in the paper. Um, there are four um, solar carports um, arrays um, that will be constructed over every, so they will be over, over every other um, row of parking. Um, so, that, so they're not over every single um, space um, and um, the, the um, disabled marked bays, um, I, my understanding is that the carports are not um, being installed over those ones. Um, the structure themselves, are quite limited actually in terms of um, the support structures will be at either end of um, the array um, so should present no no access issues at all. Could Thank I you just very follow, may I just follow up really quickly Chair? I'm actually wondering too about their access to the actual facility. People, persons with a disability, we hear that their own parking spaces are not being interfered with, but what is the level of access to the actual power facility itself? Thank you. So was that their level of access to the to the solar array uh, energy charging facilities, the car charging facilities? Are we at that kind of detail, Claire, with regard to whether um, the charging facilities will be uh, easily dis uh, disabled access? I'm, I'm afraid I don't have the detail on that. No, that's something that the Civic Hub project board are, are installing. Yeah. Could I just say that it's, it's actually a key issue because if persons with a disability have cars that require access to this mm -hmm. facility, then if it's not accessible, 
to them. Um, the, and we know that their parking spaces have to be larger, then this is a real concern. So I would like sorry. that to be minuted. Mm. I think, sorry, Councillor Scott, I think we're crosswise here. I thought you were referring to the energy ch uh, car charging um, stations being disabled friendly. The disabled spaces will not be impacted from my understanding from the solar carports at all. Um, mm -hmm. With regard to the detail around whether the uh, energy charging stations themselves are disabled, uh, ac uh, disabled accessible, I'm sure that will be considered in the detailed design, um, but we're not at that stage yet of the planning process. Um, uh, but that's really good that you flagged that up. And I think, you know, if we are having car charging uh, stations, it should be accessible to everybody. So I think it's a really good thing for you to flag up. So thank you thank for you. doing yeah, so. I just re-emphasise that it's absolutely key. It's really key that persons with a disability who use cars should be able to have access to this facility and it should have been thought about ahead of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and just to note before I move on to the next speaker, which is Councillor Gardner, um, and to thank Emma Fitch, who has joined the meeting um, here to answer potentially any planning questions. And that may be more over on the process of planning, if there's anything that flags up in our discussions. So thank you, Emma, for joining us. Uh, Councillor Gardner. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, I just really need to declare an interest here, as I am the Vice Chairman of the Planning Committee on Huntingdonshire District Council. I think I would be best to not say anything on with regard to the the planning so that if it does come to committee then I haven't prejudged the application before it comes. I've just noticed, thank you for that Councillor Gardner, I noticed uh, Emma's going to, uh, Fitch is going to want to jump in here but I believe that's because it's a regulation three I think uh, uh, planning application um, but Emma did you want to just confirm that so that uh, Councillor Gardner can indeed uh, take part in discussion and vote? Well, um, technically, um, you're correct, it is a Regulation 3, but Councillor Gardner is a Vice Chairman of our own Planning Committee, so he would still actually have the, the, the same concerns. Um, but it was just, you're correct, uh, to say it would be a Regulation 3 item. So, and just to confirm for benefit of the public and members who perhaps not heard the term before, but Regulation 3 means that it's determined by the County Council, um, as opposed to the Local Planning Authority, the Huntington District. Um, but that being the case, Councillor Gardner, I think it's very wise that you don't vote on this. Um, and I note that your only comment has been to declare that interest. Can I ask uh, uh, perhaps Steve Cox or another officer just to confirm the, uh, any other members that are members of our planning committee? Should they be declaring interest um, potentially on this item? If they, if they are members of the planning committee, yes, they should. Um, members will know if, if, they, if they are. Emma, did you wish to come yeah. in? I apologise. It's not letting me raise my hand, which is why I'm having to keep waving at the screen. Um, but there, there are actually um, substitutes of the planning committee that I can see um, on the screen as well. So I think it would be beneficial for them just to um, be aware that um, should an item need to come to planning committee, that they will also need to note their interest. Yeah. Um, and I suggest having... Sorry, just one moment. If I can just suggest, uh, having been uh, chairman of planning committee East Camps, I, I think the discussion hasn't really been go gone into the planning detail of the application. Uh, so therefore members providing you don't make comments around the detail of the application um, and uh, the sort of fundamental merit or dismerit of the application, then you won't be predetermining yourselves. So simply to flag up very quickly, if you are a member or substitute of the committee um, as a, a potential conflict, but I don't believe that it would be significant enough to preclude you from voting or commenting further. Um, I will reserve that comment um, to, uh, to not apply to Councillor Gardner as Vice Chairman because uh, any potential delegation might be done with the Chairman and Vice Chairman in consultation, so it probably affects you slightly more, Councillor Gardner, so I think it's still wise that you don't vote on the item. So can I just ask now, those members or substitutes of the Planning Committee, if you could raise your hand on screen um, and then I can see who they are. So that's Councillor John Gowing, Councillor Peter Hudson, Councillor Jan Janet French and Councillor Ian Gardner, we note as Vice Chairman. So I've read those names out. Oh, and Councillor Jocelyn Scott as well. And, and Councillor Bradnam. Oh, sorry, Councillor Bradman, I missed your wave there. Thank you. So I've read those names out. We're aware now and the public are aware of those, um, of declaring those very, very uh, sort of, I think belt and braces approach to declaring interests. Um, and the only person it precludes from any further debate or comment, I think will be Councillor Gardner. Moving on, thank you for that, Emma, that's helpful. And I'm glad we just took that off. Councillor Peter. Yes, Councillor Bradman. Sorry, I just wanted to point out that I had put my hand up to speak when you're ready, but 
Thank you. I have noticed uh, you are next in the list after Councillor Hudson. So Councillor Hudson first and then followed by Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I despair. I absolutely sometimes despair. We are the Environmental and Sustainability Committee. Um, let's think about the word environmental. And you know, people are complaining about we're leaving a planet destroying building and moving into a planet saving building. Um, I just, I'm plus making many millions of pounds to invest in our frontline services. We talked today the possibility of reducing our. Uh, even more carbon reduction activities on the new planet saving building and for people on this committee to complain about leaving a planet destroying building and moving into a planet saving building and to quote our bible the wailing and gnashing of teeth perhaps i sat on the wrong committee chair thank you Count, thank you councillor hudson uh councillor bradman Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's just a general um, point, um, following on from the point that Councillor Wilson made about, uh, and that, about it, it seemed unfortunate that we were having to limit the generation that we could do on this carport, because of course Alcanbury Weald is is a big site. It's got all sorts of industrial buildings on it, and residential premises as well. And it just seems slightly odd. I'm, and I just wanted to ask Cheryl French, really. Um, there was a point at which in one of our briefings, Cheryl, you did consider whether where these expensive grid connections become, um, are triggered and, and don't panic. I'm not suggesting it for this project, but you did suggest that the county might consider being the first connector and then divvying up the costs to any subsequent connectors. Now, in a place like Alconbury Weald, does it not um, kind of behove us as a, an environmentally aware council to consider doing that as a, a, not a philanthropic thing, but as a thing for our future, you know, that in future we're going to need this power and it seems crazy to size something small just because we don't want to trigger this. And I'm not, as I say, I'm not saying for this project, but do we not need to be generally thinking about, well, okay, if there are projects where we do need to be the first connector, that then we consider ways in which we can then uh, share those costs amongst subsequent connectors. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Bradman. And I'm sorry, I won't uh, bring in Cheryl on this item only because th this is not about the carport uh, uh, item that we're talking about today. Um, this is a much wider issue. And I appreciate your point, Councillor Bradman, that we do need to discuss that. And I'm sure at the appropriate time, we can have a paper about us um, and how we might look at um, connections as investments almost, or you know, where we will connect and then uh, uh, we can levy the connection to other people. But that's not what we're considering today. Today, we're considering the expenditure of uh, the, the uh, 180,000 pounds plus contingency uh, on this progressing this project. So I don't want us to drift into other items. So I appreciate the point and I'm sure it's noted. And yes, it has flagged up that we, we do need to address this issue going forward with other projects. I'd like um, it, if it's possible, I'd like it to be noted that I asked that question. I'm sure, and I'm sure it will be in the, in the minutes. Not uh, for, the appropriate for the committee, but I would like it to be noted that I asked it. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm just mindful that, you know, the, the first meeting we strayed in all kinds of areas to do with PPE and, and other areas in, in the ENS committee. And the others, as much as we should be far reaching as ENS and have that golden thread as we talked about before, we must keep on focus on what we're doing today, which is to look at this carport application and to approve the expenditure on the groundworks, which is what the recommendation is asking for. So uh, Emma Fitch, I have now got a raised hand from you on the side, but I think that's probably uh, in the mix of trying to raise and lower, but that, oh, that's fine, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so members, I've had no comments now to the contrary about the, uh, or to, to not support recommendations in Claire's paper. Um, and I, so I'll move this to the vote. And again, I will take this, the same uh, pattern I had previously in that if you disagree with the recommendations, um, then please use the raise hand function now. And if so, I will go to an uh, individual vote and take record of it. And I've had no indication. So on that basis, I will take the recommendations as unanimously supported. Thank you very much, Claire, uh, for that paper. Thank you. Which sorry. now moves us. So, sorry, but not by the people on the planning committee have to exempt us. 
apologies and thank mm. you very much councillor scott for pointing out it was only councillor uh um uh, where are you a gardener councillor gardener who um has, has has not voted on this item because he's vice chairmanship of the planning committee other planning committee members i do that there's been no reason why you couldn't vote in favor of this item it doesn't preclude you from future debit discussions around the planning application itself um, i didn't understand that i need to abstain then over the disability issue because until i'm satisfied about the disability access i can't agree with the proposal sorry so just thank you very you put much me abstaining thank you thank you so that's a, a councillor scott abstained and i'm sure i've seen james nod to, to note that thank you which moves us on to our next agenda item which is the community uh, consultation on a heat supply at swaffham prior community heat project and again, uh, before I introduce uh, Cheryl French to take us through the report um, from the chair, I accept this is a late report on the following grounds. The reason for lateness, the heat tariff model, uh, modelling was only finalised and tested for equivalent costs on service costs for oil boilers on the 1st of July 2020. The re report therefore could only be finalised once this evidence had been made available. And the reason for urgency is to require committee approval for officers to consult on the heat supply agreement and the tariff prices with Swap and Prior community ahead of asking them to formally sign a heat supply agreement from September 2020. Taking a report to committee at this stage will allow the project time to share the contents of the HSA and explain it is in detail ahead of formal signatures to the local community before September. Um, just to add to that, we are all aware, and Cheryl has made, made us aware before, that the urgency of this project is very much linked to the government funding around uh, the um, uh, grant funding around heat supply and energy uh, that we are, have been made aware of in other papers. So thank you. I will now ask Cheryl French, the Programme Director uh, for Climate Change and Energy Investment to introduce the report. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, thank you, Councillor Schumann. So, in May this year, I took a report on the Soft and Prior Community Heat Project uh, to Commercial and Investment Committee. And um, at committee, they agreed the outline business case and the commercial structure for the project. So just to quickly let you know what that means is that Cambridge County Council is looking to invest through Public Works Loan Board borrowing to build the energy centre um, at Swaffham Prior, which will be a renewable heat centre, and it will also set up a pipe company to deliver a district heating network, which will go to all homes in Swaffham Prior. Um, homes, the school and the pub, and um, whichever other new buildings come online over the next few years. As part of that agreement um, with CNI, we um, agreed that we would come forward with an investment grade proposal later in the year and that investment grade proposal is going to come to this committee for decision and so the target for coming forward is somewhere october november for that investment decision and the work from may till that point is around commercialization of the scheme and there are lots of pieces of um, um, commercialization uh, work that is ongoing currently. One of those pieces is the heat supply agreements and that's what I'd like to focus on today. So um, when we come forward with your investment decision, for your investment decision, there are a number of income streams that are going to be dependent on uh, one, a renewable heat incentive. The second one is going to be on customer signups and the customers in Swaff and Prior want to um, have a view or sight of the terms and conditions on a heat supply agreement before they sign up, just as any of us as customers of heat or electricity would want to do is you'd want to understand what does the cost look like and what is the service that I'm going to get. So what we've worked hard with our lawyers to bring and actually the uh, Jonathan Treyer in finance is to bring um, forward a, um, a terms and conditions uh, for a heat supply agreement to be able to go out to the community and say this is what it's going to look like. Can we have your feedback on whether it's acceptable? Um, and the reason we're looking at the acceptability side is that we'd had a discussion 
just under two years ago with a group of um, residents, um, actually it was in the Red Lion pub, um, to work through what would be a barrier to them as individuals in the community signing up to a heat supply agreement with us, the council. And they'd put over some key issues like, you know, we wouldn't want to be able to have to sign a 20 year contract. Um, how would we guarantee value for money? Um, what are the insurance challenges that we would face and how much would it cost to connect? Um, and what are our responsibilities within that process? So what we hope is that the heat supply agreements that we've now got developed um, will answer those questions and will also then be acceptable in terms of price to the community. So the reason it's important to have at least a six week consultation is that we want to be able to just take the community through what this means. This is a, a, a legally binding document and we're not keen to um, just put it on the table for residents without taking them quite carefully through the different aspects of what this heat supply agreement means to them because it means we're going to access their home. It means we're going to take out their existing oil boiler. We'll take away their oil tanks and we'll be putting something into their house called a heat interface unit. So we have to get permission to come into their homes to do those works as part of this agreement. They also want to know just how much it's going to cost them. And they also want to know um, if they want to sell their house for any reason, what, how does that affect them if they're in a heat supply agreement? So this paper, I'm hoping, answers many of those questions. And we've provided as Appendix A, just sort of the simplified version of the heat supply agreements that we will, we will take out to the community alongside a much more detailed legally binding document. We didn't include that document here because it's quite lengthy, um, but um, you can have access to that uh, if you um, want to ask me after the meeting. So I think that's it. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, I think it probably would be really helpful if you don't mind circulating to all members of this committee that document so they can have a read through at their pleasure. Um, members, uh, I think, as always, Cheryl has introduced the paper brilliantly and walked us through the, 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 whole, uh, the whole thing. Um, do you have any questions or comments? Councillor Dupre. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do think this was a very helpful report and I'm, I'm full of admiration for the way in which um, Cheryl and the team have been juggling a really complex, really genuinely community initiative here. Um, I note that we are being asked at this stage merely to approve the, um, the draft agreement goes out and to move to consultation and join the heat trust. Um, I think I'm looking forward to a decision later, a discussion later on in the year about the, the investment decision and the risks with that and so on. But that's not for now. What is for now is the discussion about and the decision about moving forward with the next stage of community consultation. And I'm more than happy, I think, with what we've been presented with. I think an enormous amount of work has gone into this to make this as attractive as possible to residents to take up while at the same time still um, being satisfactorily uh, financially viable. And I think that that's been a real juggling exercise and all credit to those involved in getting this to this stage so far. Thank you very much uh, for those comments, Councillor Dupre. And actually, from my perspective, having looked at the draft HSAs, the, the user friendliness of that document to try and make it, because it is such, as you Councillor Dupre noted, it's such a complex issue that trying to explain that in a way which is accessible to everybody um, is a real challenge. And I think we've, well, Cheryl and the team certainly have got it about as spot on as possible. So thank you for that. Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Likewise, uh, I think if anybody can um, explain clearly to members of the public uh, these complicated matters, it's Cheryl French, so well done, uh, because the document is excellent and very straightforward given the complexity of the situation. Um, I 
just wondered whether how big a risk you felt that the um, the customer's newfound wish to be able to switch is going to be in this process. Do you think we, because we're going to need to build a relationship with them, aren't we? So that they need, they want to stay and, and aren't tempted away by other offers. Thank you. It, it's a really good question. So, um, and as you saw, they weren't inclined to want to sign up to a 20 year agreement because of the fact that they wanted to know that there was going to be best value and you could compare prices that we were offering for our heat to equivalent prices that would be offered to others or that others would be paying with other systems. So what we've built into the process is that, um, the first one is that the price will be less than the price of oil that they pay currently. Now, we know we've got a bit of a blip in oil price, but uh, that's not going to sustain. Um, and then the second issue is that every five years, we will do a benchmark calculation, um, which will demonstrate the um, best value price that we're going to offer them. So it's again benchmarked against oil so that you're paying a best price, but also benchmarked against other heating systems. And we expect that at that point, if we can demonstrate best value, there won't be a desire to change. Mm -hmm. The other issue that you're raising here is the monopoly position. And so, in fact, discussions with the community have been interesting here because when you are based on oil, you don't have much choice of your supplier. It's not like you're going online and switching continuously to be able to get the best tariff. So you're dependent on quite a few suppliers. So they've been quite used to a, a monopoly position. Mm. That's helpful. Thank you, Cheryl. It's, um, it did sound a little bit like, you know, the, the tagline of never knowingly undersold, um, which is uh, exactly sort of the, the, the stance we want to take. Um, so <laughs> the thank you. Point, um, which I'm sure that will um, the work you've done will go a long way towards, but it's almost like, is there anything else that we as a provider need to do to build the relationship? You know, apparently 166 set signed up, but there are some 300 properties and it's kind of building a relationship with that village, isn't it? To ensure that they feel confident in the council as a supplier. And I'm just wondering what we do to make sure that that happens. Can I, can I just, before Cheryl comes in and answers that, um, can I just step in perhaps, I mean, as the local member um, for Sort and Prior, I think um, some of the comments I've heard back um, from residents who haven't signed up yet or um, have had concerns is really about um, the uh, stage at which the project was at. And I think that's natural that there's going to be a nervousness to say, I'm really interested before you know the detail. Um, and actually, is it going to happen and all of those things? And, and can I be bothered for some people that are working or busy and, you know, they've got busy lives. Can I be bothered to even find out that detail right now? No, wait until it's further on the line and actually becomes a reality almost. So I think there is a certain amount of sort of trepidation that comes along with that, that as this project sort of progresses and this, this HSA agreement, um, I think will help that in that, that re-engagement again with the community. Uh, it starts to become very real. And I think people then become very interested. And when it comes to the, the, you know, how we get people to buy in, the branding is everything here. And I think the, the fact it's continually referred to as a community heat project. This is not about the, you know, a council, a, a council energy provider. Um, fundamentally, that's almost, you know, what, what it will become. But it is about the community almost having their, their own heat network. And as long as people feel like that, I think there'll be much more buy in and much more incentive to kind of be part of that. Um, Cheryl, did you want to add to, to any of the, the sort of how we're going to try and manage that uh, interest? Well, um, I, th I think you're right. One of the things that the community has been waiting for is the price. Um, mm. And so now we're able to try and we can give them as accurate a price as possible. Um, obviously, we haven't gone through the full commercialization, but so hopefully that will help. And um, Councillor Schumann's right. People haven't quite thought we would be able to get it off the ground. This is the first project. Um, it's not easy. Um, it is hard working with our, um, a village of 300 homes. 
And I think like with anything, you get early adopters and you'll get later adopters. So um, the, the key issue is that we have enough early adopters who will come on the journey from the outset. And to incentivize that, we're offering no connection fees so that it's no cost to join the scheme. That's great. And that's a really, really good note um, to sort of answer Councillor Bradman's question of how we're going to get more people on board. Um, and actually, just to finish off on that comment that we have a, I'm sure Cheryl, you've seen it as much as me, a real spectrum of people when it comes to the community in this project. Some that are, you know, driving the project through and quite honestly, without some of those names that we have come very familiar with who have been absolutely instrumental in this project, it wouldn't have happened. Um, yeah. All the way through to those that are very supportive in nature. To, all the way to, to those that are quite fundamentally against anything that we're trying to do. And we're trying to work with every part of those to try and convince them that this is this is a good thing and the right thing to do. So, um, and and full credit again to, to not just Cheryl and the team, but those extended members of the CLT and, and the project who have tried to bring everybody on board because there are some, uh, certainly some skeptics out there that are not so keen on the project. Uh, Councillor Scott, I've got you indicated next to speak. Yeah, um Thank you, Chair. Um, I too want to add my um, applaudits to the presentation and to the report and the clarity of it. The only concern I've got is that, of course, when people sign up, my assumption is they're going to have to sign up the more complicated legal document. And I'm wondering whether when they do that, th there must be somebody from the council that takes them through it and it explains it to them in terms of the legal dimensions of the more complicated document, because that's what they're going to have to sign ultimately, isn't it? I expect, I, I would expect. Thank you. Um, yes, Councillor Scott. So one of the um, uh, things we're developing at the moment is um, short videos, which will, which our legal representatives, Sharp Pritchard, uh, Johnny Trayer in finance, and our community engagement person will describe different parts of the heat agreement so that you can understand in more detail what it's saying, but through a short video. And we'll be um, putting examples on screens and doing webinars to be able to demonstrate that. The other issue that we have concerns is that while we're currently in the COVID pandemic, um, there are a lot of people who are obviously shielding and you can't get directly face to face with some people who probably need a little bit more comfort around going through um, a, a new heat supply agreement because they've been used to 30 years of doing the same thing on their oil boiler. Now, one of my concerns is how do we manage that sympathetically over the next few months? And I think we have to accept that some people will take longer to come on board just because we can't get face to face with them in, in the short term. The other thing that I thought you might be interested in, Councillor Scott, is that the Heat Trust, which is the um, um, the trust really setting the best practice um, standards for all these new emerging heat networks is very focused on vulnerable customers. And, and um, the, the critical issue for us here is that we will have a spectrum of customers in the village and we need to ensure that there's the right protections are in place through all of our agreements and um, signing up to the heat trust will putting the community on the front foot because they then have the, the heat trust as their advocates on that process. So I think that's a really important issue to raise. If, if I could just follow up to you, yes. I mean, I'm not sure whether there will be people in the village whose first language is not English, but that's a really important issue too. It's just I'm raising it because I've represented many people who got into trouble or the banks got into trouble and the banks didn't properly explain um, to the clients and guarantors and so on. And it really, I mean, as you're recognising, it's a really key key issue and um, people with, with literacy difficulties too need to be paid attention to but I understand that you appreciate that and I think the idea of the video and the webinars is a very good one but of course then people have to have access don't they 
to the webinar, to the videos, we're recognising this in terms of access to Zoom, that not everybody is familiar with that form of technology. But thank you for the work that you're doing in, in, to, in with these issues in mind. Thanks. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for your helpful comments, Councillor Scott, about I'm sure the uh, English uh, not being a first language is on the radar of uh, Cheryl and the teams that will be working with all areas of the Top and Pride community. It's, um, it's almost at 300 households, almost just about small enough to, to individualise those kind of pieces of work. Um, and it would be interesting now as a demonstrator project how you'd replicate that over a potentially much bigger community because uh, I think those challenges would become more significant. But thank you for flagging those up. Uh, Emma Fitch, have you indicated, or is that again just a, um, oh, you have, thank you. Yes, I've read Emma. Yeah, um, again, just for the purposes of the minutes, um, nothing's been said that um, is showing any signs of predetermination, but this is also another project that will be coming forward for a planning application that doesn't actually have planning <coughs> permission yet. Uh, we are working very closely with our East Cambridgeshire colleagues and I will be procuring um, a planner from East Cambridgeshire District Council to work on this on our behalf, um, but it would be ultimately our planning um, committee that would consider um, the item as we move forward and we get the detail. As such, I'd probably recommend that Councillor Gardner um, does not vote again on this item, if that's okay. Yeah, can I just add to that, just so you are aware, um, the planning application submission is imminent. Um, so certainly within the next week or so. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Um, can I just, uh, and, I, and I don't mean wish at all to challenge that opinion, Emma, and, and I'll happily be belt and brace approach uh, to this, but the recommendations in the report are very much about the consultation on the HSA agreement, and the report focuses on all of that. So there is nothing in the report from, unlike the carport, which was, you know, talk about foundations and the principle of planning being a risk, this report doesn't touch on any planning issues whatsoever, as far as I'm aware. So um, I, I uh, would feel that perhaps uh, Councillor Gardner could contribute and potentially vote on this one, unless you feel that that's probably still a little bit too uh, close. No, I know we, we didn't put anything in planning on this one, but I did just want it uh, minuted um, so people are just mindful of that. So, yeah, more, more than happy. Thank you. I just don't want to preclude uh, Councillor Gardner from every every vote to go for. No, I, I appreciate you flagging. Thank you so much, that Emma. And uh, actually, member uh, officers and, and Steve, I perhaps leave this with you. Uh, we'll perhaps look at this because we just want to make sure that we we cross this off every time, so we don't find ourselves tripping over it. Um, and so we note those members of the planning committee, members, substitutes, and, and vice chairman that are present in the room. But also note that there's nothing in this paper that addresses any planning issues, and we haven't mentioned as part of the discussions. I've had no comments to the uh, contrary um, or, or to not in support of the recommendations. Um, and thank you for those that contributed and um, made comments. Um, so I will now move to the vote on this item. And uh, again, I'll take this as a unanimous stance unless I see a raised hand in the next few seconds on the raised hand function, which I haven't. So that being the case, I'll take that as recommendations unanimously supported. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you. Which moves us on to our next agenda item, which is agenda item number eight, I believe. If I just done eight, I'm losing track myself now. Oh no, sorry, we're on agenda item number nine. Um, and that's the appointments to external bodies. Uh, this is particularly the local nature of the partnership, natural Cambridgeshire governance structure. Um, and can I invite Philip Clark and Julia Beaton to introduce this report? Thank you both. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just gonna be myself, Julia Beaton. Thank you, Julia. Um, Thank you, committee. I'm the, the Flood Risk and Biodiversity Manager at the County Council, and um, I'll just take you through a summary of the Local Nature pa um, Partnership Governance paper. So the Natural Cambridgeshire is the name of our Local Nature Partnership. Um, local Nature Partnerships were, were set up to help provide and will help achieve a high quality natural environment within within our area and to try and to coordinate with uh, planning and local decision making to make sure the environment is valued in local decisions. Currently our partnership um, is, is just that, it's a partnership, it has no formal, uh, no formal um, kind of model, it's got no staff and it's got no funding. And so while the individual partners of the local nature partnership, for example, the County Council, National Trust, the RSPB, we all deliver our own projects, the LNP itself has no ability to deliver projects as a, as a partnership. 
and therefore the local nature partnership wants to change its governance so natural Cambridgeshire wants to become a charitable incorporated organization i'll refer to that as a cio going forward and um, they want to do that so that they can have that structure they'll be able to hold funds of their own and they'll be able to be responsible for, for projects uh, a charitable incorporated organisation has been specifically chosen because it enables the trustees on the board to have very limited liability or potentially even zero liability, which is an important, you know, important element for, for trustees to bear in mind. The Local Nature Partnership has uh, quite a few different boards and meetings at the moment, but going forward, they're going to rationalise those. And in the new structure, there will be a board of trustees and there will be a partnership forum. Uh, those two key tiers. There may later on be certain working groups, but we're not um, concerned with those today. And those, off those working groups will often be officer based. So the, the, part, the first part of the paper today is really asking for the council to appoint a member to sit on that board of trustees. Uh, council officers have put in a request for the county council to be able to have a seat on the, the board. Um, there was initially some discussion about whether there should be a seat for every council in Cambridge and Peterborough, or just for the combined authority or just a selected number. Um, but we've received a very positive reception to asking uh, if the county council could have a seat in its own right. So we're asking officers, uh, councillors to appoint a member for that purpose. And I should draw the uh, committee's attention to the section in the report um, which, which talks about um, in 2.5 that the member on the board would not be specifically representing the county council they would be there taking their county council experience to benefit the charity and they would need to act in accordance with the, the new governance uh, of the charitable purpose of the, the local nature partnership just to be clear the partnership forum will also uh, exist and that may also have a member on it. It does currently have a member, Councillor Lena Nieto sits on the, the partnership, it's currently called the partnership board but it'll be the partnership forum going forward and so it's expected that going forward that would continue to have, if we want, member representation and it would also have officer representation. So the proposal is that we don't we don't remove that from our list of uh, appointees, we keep someone at that end but we at that level but we also appoint a new member, hence the paper today. The paper is in two, two sections really, that being the first element, the second bit um, being about support. Chair, would you like me to move on to the second part of the paper and take questions at the end, or do you want to deal with the two elements separately? No, that would be great if you could do okay. both parts, thank you. So the support element is based around the fact that for the last 12 years, we have supported the Local Nature Partnership to a fair extent, providing in, in recent years, the last eight years, we've provided them um, with an approximate grant of a thousand pounds a year. And we've also, provided almost full of secretariat for the committee. So that's everything from minutes and meetings to, to website and the Twitter account, uh, organizing speakers and, and all sorts of different things. Um, so we've had to think about, you know, what our position will be going forward. Uh, the LNP has, has formally requested, uh, you know, support from us and asked what we can, what we can give to them. We have to bear in mind that the council works with a large number of different charitable organisations across the county. And um, while the LNP is a very valuable one and brings together a lot of really, um, you know, really useful and experienced partners, it, you know, the council can't necessarily support every charitable organisation out there, hence the need for, for member approval. So in terms of the secretariat, um, this role did take up uh, nearly two days a week, every week. Um, and the, the team at the moment, the Flower Risk and Biodiversity team, is, is very much gearing up to help deliver the climate change and environment strategy recommendations. And we've got quite a lot of large projects and quite exciting projects ahead of us. And so we feel that the focus of the team on those and the need to deliver those actions means that we will be unfortunately unable to continue delivering those secretariat support. We have therefore considered and looked at other options within the council, but have been unable to find a suitable resource that the LNP is provisionally aware of this and has asked other partners if they could uh, take over to provide the, the secretariat. So put, bringing those things together, the recommendation going forward is that we do provide support for the, the Local Nature Partnership, Natural Cambridgeshire, but it isn't in terms of secretariat, it's in terms of a one-off grant of £5,000 to be provided to them this year, and that will help them to set up the CIO and provide them with some initial administrative support it enables them to, you know, to do things like upgrade their, their website, uh, as I said, to set up the trust and, and to start, start working up some of their projects into, into a more kind of shovel ready projects. And um, they very much want to become a delivery organization and, and hence the reason for the, the change. 
Um, I will pause there, Chair, ready to take any questions. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you for that, that uh, explanation. Both parts of it is very helpful. Members, any questions for Julia on the report? Councillor Scott. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for a clear report. Um, I've had a number of representations from people within the Cambridge area because there's a real concern about the level of development that's going on in Cambridge and the the need for attention to be paid, for example, to water resources, the river and so on. And the concerns that they're raising go to the river and the green spaces within Cambridge. And I'd imagine that there'd be persons raising issues such as this outside Cambridge as well. Their concern is that the membership of this body is or appears to be highly um, directed towards business interests rather than community interests and their concern is as to how membership is selected for this particular body and why there is such a business concentration and how the question of conflict of interest is dealt with by those members of the body who have business interests that clearly would put them in a conflict of interest situation in relation to some decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Scott. Julia, would you wish to respond? Okay. So, so firstly, just to, so I am aware of the um, of those issues that have been raised, but just to clarify something, the Local Nature Partnership has no formal decision making powers. It has no decision making abilities in terms of planning or, or any other elements. So, in that sense, it is it's quite hard for them to have a, a really serious conflict of interest. Um, secondly, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, a lot of the concern was around the fact that there are a couple of developers on the, the board. Um, the large percentage of members is very much NGOs. It, it isn't what I would classify as a, as a commercial enterprise. It's very much people like the Wildlife Trust, um, Natural England and Environment Agency, you'll see government bodies like the councils, um, but also the RSPB um, and lots of smaller environmental charities. They very much make up the, uh, the, the breadth of the board. Um, and then it leaves, um, the chair who is acting independently but who does have his own communications business, uh, Neem Park Trust which is set up as a business but to manage green space and then um, Urban and Civic and O&H Hampton who have those commercial interests. Um, those that are on the, the board um, have been very much kind of tested by the, the partnership over the years with their interests and um, they are those that come with uh, biodiversity and environmental experience so it isn't you know the, the management for example of the, the organizations um, and they have for example worked to deliver uh, toolkits like the developing with nature toolkit and um, which is a very useful tool for for developers so they have proved their uh, I think their value to the, the board um, because one of the concerns is that across Cambridgeshire, you know, we are going to have a large amount of, of growth. And the, the board is very much of the view that we can't, you know, it, this, there's a traditional view from some environmentalists that you should, we could be completely anti-growth and that we can, you know, act to, to improve nature separately. That's that's not gonna happen in, in Cambridgeshire. We need to work alongside developers to make sure they're delivering high quality, sustainable environments. And to do that, we do need to understand the mind of a developer. And that's why those, those organizations were brought onto the board so that we can challenge them. And that does happen within the board. There definitely are those challenges. And we can ask them questions and say, why aren't you considering this? And, and then make them go away and, and, you know, come back. And likewise, they can challenge us. Um, so it, I think from an officer point of view, it feels that that balance is, is struck, but also the local nature party is very keen going forward to be as transparent as possible. They want to respond to these queries. Um, and I would um, let members know that their agendas and minutes are available publicly on their website. And I, I believe and hope that this will continue going forward. Um, and I think in terms of those questions, the, the LNP would very much and be very happy uh, to welcome you know, others to the board. The partnership forum certainly, uh, in the terms of references, it says it's open to any individual or any organisation with living or with any commercial base in Peterborough or Cambridgeshire. And so I very much encourage local residents to, to get involved. That is certainly an open invite from the LNP. May I just come back on that? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, well, then the question is, who makes the decision as to who is appointed if, P if local residents come forward, whether from Peterborough or Cambridgeshire, who makes the decision? And the second point I would like to make is that 
uh, the problem within Cambridge, and I'm sure it's replicated elsewhere, is that we have not had a good experience with developers, at least many uh, members of the community here. It is my belief would say that the experience with developers has not been a positive one. Therefore, I would suggest that rather than having the developers as members of this body so that they're equal participants, perhaps co-opt them uh, if it seems appropriate that a developer view should be put or call them into meetings when a developer view is sought rather than having them as actual members of the body. Uh, that I think would be a more satisfactory solution because of the concerns there are about developers and the approach that many of them appear to take. Uh, so back to the question though, if all these people come forward and say that they have an interest in joining the board, how is that decision made that they will or won't become a member? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so I'll, I'll very much take away the point about the developers. The LNP is certainly aware of those, those questions, as I said, and wants to be as open and transparent as possible. So I will certainly bring that suggestion to them um, about their, their terms of reference. At the moment, it doesn't refer specifically to a developer, but just to two representatives of, of business. Um, but as I said, I'll, I'll take that comment back to them. Um, in terms of the decision, so anyone can uh, contact Natural Cambridge and ask to join the partnership board, that the partnership forum, sorry, that is, uh, yeah, is you know, encouraged. Um, and then in terms of moving forward to be on the, the board, I think it's a matter of, um, you know, if someone demonstrates that they've got the environmental experience to be able to contribute, you know, the environmental knowledge to, to make, uh, you know, to help inform uh, other authorities and partners around the, the, uh, the county, then I think they would be encouraged. So there might be an element of, of getting to, to know them, but there is, a, um, it says within the terms of reference that three representatives can be uh, nominated from the partnership forum up to sit on the, the board. Um, and that is a vote taken by by those on the, the board, which as I said, is, is much more outweighed in terms of uh, the balance is more with NGOs than it is with developers. So while they would be voted on by the, the partners, um, I think they would stand a, a good chance. And there are some examples um, of uh, lecturers from Cambridge University, for example, who aren't representing the university, they have retired um, and they have in a similar way, asked questions, got involved, joined the meeting um, and then have in the, in the current structure have been asked to, to join in the executive level because they've they, you know, they demonstrated that they're valuable. And that's what people, that's what the group wants. It wants to bring together the best expertise about the environment and the natural, uh, natural environment and green open space into one committee so that we can help to provide useful, useful guidance and, and um, projects going forward. Thank you very much for that really um, comprehensive answer, Julia. And I think uh, um, it, we have an opportunity if we're being asked today to, to appoint our trustee or board member um, uh, that um, we can make sure as a, a, a sort of our representative that we pass on that they are carrying out good governance checks or you know, audits of skills, et cetera. So we're making sure the board is made up of the right people, which I'm sure they would do anyway. Um, but we can use our um, position on that organisation to ensure that is happening and that the board is operating in the best way possible. Uh, thank you, Councillor Anna Bradman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, uh, I wanted to pick up a slightly related point, I suppose. Um, it's really interesting. Thank you, Julia, for the um, talking us through the paper. Um, I just wondered whether, because of the concerns that have been expressed, whether it would be um, normal, and you've said that the papers and all the documents are um, open to the public, I just wondered, would the board, would it be anticipated in the normal way that they would have a register of interests that they would need to declare interests on? Yes, I believe so. I, I, I can't say 100%, but I, I believe that, you know, that would be very important to the, the situation, not just um, you know, for the, for the business reasons of the obvious ones that have been expressed, but um, you know that there are often times with with planning decisions or things where there there could potentially be a conflict of interest. So I'd be very surprised if there isn't, and I would definitely feed that comment back. I mean, for example, you mentioned um, uh, retired members of the university. That's great, and they've got expertise, but they're also very big landowners. So you know, it's uh, it's um, it would be useful, I think, and uh, it would offer clarity if. If there was a register of interests. Thank you. I think, 
yeah, sorry, thank you. I think um, Councillor Bram, you, you raise again a very good point, and um, uh, and I'm sure most of us are involved, or many of us are involved with other organisations where registers of interests are taken and kept and made, and, and for the purpose of transparency, I think it sounds very sensible. So if they haven't got that in place, I think it's certainly a prime opportunity for us, our member, to suggest they do have all very yeah. clear registers. It's not, it's not mentioned interest. in the terms of reference, and it would seem a logical thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Uh, Councillor Dupre. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I just have a, a what I think is a minor question, um, which is on 1.1. Um, the refers to working closely with local authorities, local enterprises with capital initial letters and health and well-being boards. I didn't know whether that meant local enterprises with lowercase letters, as in local businesses, or whether it meant local enterprise partnerships of which, of course, the one for Cambridgeshire is, I think, unique in actually being a business board of the combined authority. So I just wanted clarity as to whether it was, what the meaning of local enterprises was in that paragraph. Um, on the, the, the larger points, I think the points have been well made already that there is some concern, not only locally, but nationally about, these local nature partnerships in terms of their accountability and their transparency. And I think some of those concerns are well-founded. Um, it's been stated correctly, I think, by, by Julia, that these aren't, this isn't a decision-making body as such. But I do think that it's possible to have influence without being a decision maker. And I think while they may not make decisions, these local nature partnerships can certainly make the weather, to use a fairly apt metaphor. Um, and I think there's also concern that in some cases these can be used as effectively cover for uh, proposals for development, which are anything but environmentally friendly or sustainable. Um, so I think that those concerns are well founded and I think they are concerns which while they do not affect the recommendations that we are being asked to decide today, they do, they should affect going forward our view of uh, how we engage with the, the, the new nature partnership and I think that they are things that we very much need to bear in mind. This, this isn't a body that's under our control. Um, but it is a body on which I think we have a duty to keep an eye and to be raising those issues that members have already done today, and that's helpful, those issues of transparency, accountability, and being genuinely local and representative. And I think that those are important because there are questions, I think, that are still to be addressed convincingly at a national level about these partnerships. And uh, so therefore, while I'm, I'm happy to support the, the recommendations in front of us today, I think that we do need as an authority um, to be keeping an eye on, on this partnership and to be mandating our representative insofar as we can mandate them um, to be waving the flag as well constantly for that, that local accountability and transparency in the operation of the of, of the new board. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to take the first point, Julia, around the local enterprises? Yes, uh, that embarrassingly is a is a typo, and the word partnership is missing, and it very much means local enterprise partnerships, not not local enterprises. Um, and as you say, ours is very much linked to the combined authority in Cambridgeshire, but that is there is a missing word there. It should be local enterprise partnerships. Thank you. And with regard to your second point, Councillor Dupre, I think you know that, that it echoes on from some of the other points from members around us checking governance, good governance, and making sure that we're content that the governance is being carried out correctly and transparently. Um, I'd just like to thank um, the Vice Chair, Councillor Wotherspoon, for pointing out page 70 of our uh, agenda pack, um, bullet point two. Um, it actually refers to the Board of Trustees decision making and says the Board will maintain a, a register of interests uh, uh, and which updated at least annually and published on its website and goes on. Um, so, uh, Councillor Bradman, your point earlier, hopefully will be covered on its terms of reference there. Um, but governance is incredibly important. And I agree that, you know, although not decision making, it could be influential still. So making sure it's everything's correct is, is uh, uh, absolutely our responsibility if we're going to put 
Firstly, a representative on the board, we need to check for those things and be content with them. And secondly, if we're going to support any, uh, sorry, provide any support, i.e. funding, then we equally need to make sure we're funding something we're content with operating uh, correctly. So thank you for those comments. Sorry, Julia, I've just noticed you've indicated some Thank you. Just one tiny point that I should mention is that the, um, the local nature partnership as is has confirmed to me yesterday that all the representatives for the first year, they will sit for one year only. They will only have one year term for exactly that reason, because they they know how they've been operating so far and they know that that model needs to, to change. And that will give the opportunity for a complete shake up after that for completely new members. And I think that's a positive step for them. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, just, I've got Councillor Bradman, I'll bring you in one moment. I just wanted to, to say that, um, uh, if I may propose from the chair, that we are representative that we put forward for certainly for the next year. Um, I've spoken with Councillor Lena Nieto, who's confirmed that she is happy to stay on um, or happy for, uh, to be proposed as the, the representative um, on the trustees. Um, and uh, that leaves us still with the position to appoint to uh, the board, where we, I believe we still, and you, I think, confirm we still have a seat at the board as well. Um, and so if there's any members wishing to put themselves forward or anyone uh, has uh, an interest in doing so, to please suggest now. Uh, but before I take any recommendations for a board member, I'll bring in Councillor Bradman. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, one of the things that occurred to me was, given um, the introduction that Ms. Beedon gave us, I did actually wonder whether the amount of money that we're proposing is sufficient, because two days a week um, for somebody, it, I'm just, it's a sort of general question, of have, is that going to be enough? Because it's not entirely clear to me how the projects that they're proposing to do would be funded. Um, and I'm, I presume they're trying, they're aiming to bring in grant funding to do work and uh, proceed in that way. But I just wondered whether members felt that this uh, 8,000 pounds or whatever it is, 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 about, is about right. Thank you uh, for the question. Um, with regard to your second point, I think you've answered part of it yourself. And absolutely, I think the LMP is looking to get sort of uh, get grant funding and commission its projects and work out. Uh, Julie, do you wish to touch on the reason we've, we've decided to support the, uh, the level we have? Yes. So in previous years, we've um, most of the partners have contributed £1,000 a year. That's been fairly consistent across those on the, the board. Um, the county and Peterborough have, have contributed a bit more, and obviously we contribute the secretariat as well. Um, the, the view is not that the county council will fund the LNP to, cover, to completely cover their secretariat role. It's not a direct replacement. Um, the idea is that all the partners, so that it's a fairer, um, you know, fairer mix, that all the partners will make a contribution and, and collectively that that would be um, enough to to, the, to find an alternative. Um, however, there are also currently discussions going on with some of the other councils um, as to whether they might contribute secretariat as their resource. So it may not even need to be out of our, our cash funding. Um, so the idea for the cash funding is it would help them just to get some initial work done to, some, to take their business cases for projects forward a, a little further stage. And then they would obviously apply for grant funding as, as you mentioned, but it's just to give them that initial start because you, you need time and money to write the business case in the first place to, to put in a good, you know, to put in a good bid application. So it's a, it's a starter, but hope they hope to very much for all the partners to contribute and therefore them to have a, you know, a, a decent size um, settlement you know, for, the, for the first year to start them off. Thank you very much, Julia. And Julia, can I just confirm before I move to the vote, because I have no other speakers, we're looking to obviously, as a suggested point, our board member, um, and as a, a proposed councillor, Lina Nieto, um, and was there, a, did you say we also had a place at the forum or have I misunderstood that? No, that, that's right. So we, we currently have um, Councillor Nieto on the, 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 the change of the terms, which confuses me, on the partnership forum. She's currently on that equivalent. And so we were still able to have that position. But the new post is the, the board trustee. So if Councillor Nieto wishes to move to the board trustee, I think that's what you're saying, then there Thank would you. be a vacancy. So there's two, two positions, but one is already filled potentially. Thank you. Um, and I have confirmed with Councillor Nieto, she's happy to go as uh, be our representative on the board uh, as a trustee. Um, and actually, Niet Councillor Nieto didn't suggest that she wanted to come off the forum um, and probably would be happy to sit on both, but it does give us an opportunity to put someone else forward. Is there any members wishing to uh, put themselves forward? If uh, I don't, oh, Councillor Dupre, you've indicated. Thank you, Chair. I was going to propose Councillor Bradnam. 
I'm sure she'll be incredibly grateful. Councillor Bradman, do you uh, wish to accept uh, the nomination to I, sit on the board? Well, it's, I've got slightly tangled up. I, I understood from what you said before, although I have to admit I was slightly surprised by it, that Councillor Nieto was happy to stay on the partnership forum because that's what effectively she's on now. Uh, but then you said that she's actually happy to be nominated as the person to go to the board, in which case um, I don't think that, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be nominated to be the person that goes forward to the board, um, because I think anybody can take part in the partnership forum. Right, okay. Um, no, so my, my intention, if I'm, apologies if I haven't been clear, is that Councillor Nieto has put herself forward to be our board representative um, that's the official board representative and trustee on the newly incorporated uh, charity. Um, so um, I'm happy, uh, I'm going to propose that we do ask Councillor Nieto to take that role. Um, but I think you correctly identify that we have, uh, anybody can join, I think, uh, I think Julia was suggesting anyone can join the forum um, as, a, as a member, um, but it's maybe helpful if there was any members of this committee that were particularly interested in it, that they would uh, either put themselves forward and we can uh, I'm, make sure they have information. I'm happy to be nominated to, for that if, if a nomination for that is needed. Thank you very much. I don't think it's entirely necessary, but it's great to denote and you know that you've, you've put yourself forward. Thank you very much, that Councillor Bradman. So we have our recommendations and we have a name that we, uh, uh, through Councillor Nieto, that we wish to put forward as our board member and the recommendations for the funding uh, associated and uh, identified in the report. Um, also, the report recommendations. Um, will be around the other external appointments, which obviously there are none. So, oh no, that's the future item. So I didn't got that wrong. So it's recommendations A, B, and C, with the recommendation named under B um, being Councillor Lena Nieto. Um, can I have any indications? Uh, oh, Councillor Bradley, have you indicated to speak again? Oh, sorry, that was the last one. Thank you. Great. So I will take that again because I've had no comments um, uh, against that those recommendations. Um, Councillor Scott. I don't want to object. I just think it would be helpful if there is anybody watching, if the recommendation were read so that they know precisely what it is that we're voting on. I think uh, just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will do that from the chair. So the recommendations are to endorse the council's request to appoint the, to the new board, confirm member appointment to the board, and we can uh, append to that, which is Councillor Lena Nieto, and to agree to fund the new natural Cambridgeshire up to five thousand pounds for 2020 So there are the recommendations. Um, unless I have any indications of the contrary, which, if so, can you please indicate the raised hand function now? Then I will take that as unanimously supported. Thank you very much, members. And which moves on to our next agenda item, which is, I believe, the COVID report, the Cambridgeshire County Council's response to COVID nineteen. Um, and again, if I can start by reading out this before I asked uh, the officer to introduce it, and that is that officers have been asked to bring a report on the COVID-19 responses to date for those services for which each policy and service committee is responsible. Given the rapidly changing situation and the need to provide the committee and public with the most up-to-date information possible, I've accepted this uh, as a late report on the following grounds. Reason for lateness, to allow the report to contain the most up-to-date information, and the reason for urgency to enable the committee to be briefed on the current situation in relation to the council's response to COVID-19 for the service of which it was responsible. Thank you. Now I'd like to invite uh, Steve, uh, Steve Cox, the Executive Director for Place and Economy, to introduce the report. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Chair. I'll be brief. Um, the report is quite similar to the one we saw a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, but uh, nevertheless important to to update uh, committee on uh, on uh, progress with uh, responding to, to COVID. Um, paragraph 3.1 contains the uh, the detail of matters that are relevant to place in economy, uh, and within that there are aspects that are, that are particularly relevant to uh, to this this committee, uh, particularly around the HRCs and our, our response on on the recovery. So um, I won't dwell any further on the content, but happy to take any questions um, on the, the contents of the report. Thank you very much, Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Not so much a question, but I do think this is something, although it is technically a matter for uh, the Highways and Transport Committee, it is something that the Environment and Sustainability Committee should be watching, and I think with some degree of alarm. Um, and that is the comment at the top of, I think, page three, 
that traffic levels continue to increase further <clears throat> following the opening of all non-essential retail and are now close to 70% of pre-COVID levels. Bearing in mind the number of people still furloughed, the number of facilities and amenities and working premises still shut, the fact that we are already at close to 70% of pre-COVID levels of traffic is a concern. Um, I think that there is some issue relating to people's understandable reluctance at this stage to return to public transport. Um, and indeed the, the fact that the public transport provision is not as entirely as it was pre-COVID uh, and that that may have encouraged people who previously used public transport to use their own cars. Um, I think my concern is that it's going to be very difficult once that pattern of travel has been established to get people out of it again and back onto public transport. Um, modal is, is doubly difficult. I think in these circumstances, but I do think that that, although it's technically a highways and transport matter, is something we ought particularly as a committee to be keeping an eye on because it's an, re retaining the benefits of the reduction in traffic levels in terms of air quality, noise and all the rest of it, um, is, is something we should be, we should be aiming to, uh, to achieve as far as possible. And I think that seeing that slip away from us. It's a really one-off opportunity to do something significant about this. Uh, it, and that is something that should be causing us very considerable concern. And I hope, Chair, that we will be keeping an eye on that in conjunction with Highways and Transport. Thank you very much. And I, I'm probably bringing Steve to comment in one moment on that. Um, I think you raise a very, very important issue. And um, I know that the uh, one area in particular that the uh, Combined Authority is focusing on is the bus review. Um, and I'm a member of the bus review working uh, task force. And uh, it's something which we are acutely aware of that there is a, uh, a difficult challenge around, as you highlighted, people's fear around using public transport, um, the, the transport, public transport provision, which has been reduced as a result of COVID-19 um, and us trying to keep ridership up and, and, and keep people using sustainable uh, modes of transport. So there are challenges. I know that there's an awful lot of people looking into every possible way of addressing them. Um, and uh, doing everything they can. Um, so uh, perhaps Steve, did you wish to comment further? Yeah, if I can Chair, thank you. I think it's a really important point. Um, I was in a meeting, the Transport Restart Group this week with the Combined Authority and in some parts of the county, the uh, traffic levels are getting close to 100% of what they were pre the lockdown. Um, and when you think, as Councillor Dupre has pointed out, you know, we, we haven't got schools back completely people are not going back into the office. Um, it's, it's not necessarily leading to congestion um, where we would, as we would know it, but it is, I think, across the, the day, uh, it looks like levels are getting quite close to, to where we were. So we do need to keep a very close eye on that. And one of the actions that came out of that conversation was um, as we go into the summer period uh, is to be really ready and cognizant of, of what, where we might be in September if we still have the concerns that uh, people have got about traveling on Public transport um, uh, and to be to be ready with measures to take uh, in September if if there are uh, going to be further pressures because above 100, uh, which is not where we want to be. Um, so yeah, it's a really important point. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to I can't see the page number on this version, but it's under this committee specific highlight reports. And it's talking about the booking system that's been introduced at household waste recycling centres uh, at Riplow, Alconbury, Bluntisham and Milton and St Neots. And then below that, you said um, about how that's being managed. Um, and of course, you may or may not be aware that there is a testing station based at Milton Park and Ride site, which is close by the household waste recycling centre and the park and ride site is being used as a queuing, um, convoying um, location for vehicles. Um, but the major point is whether we can um, open the household waste recycling centres soon and maybe not have the booking uh, because um, my residents and um, farmers in, my, in the local locality in Land Beach and Impington 
uh, on the same road as the entrance to the Household Waste Recycling Centre, they're finding that drivers, having been turned away because they haven't got a booking, are simply taking the waste that they had brought, intending to dump it at the Household Waste Recycling Centre, and are dumping it. And one of my farmers who is on a parish council told me that he had had four fly tips in the last three weeks. So, um, you know, this, these are at cost to the farmer. So we, you know, it, it's, ca it's causing a knock-on problem because people don't want to, or find the booking system difficult to comply with or aren't aware of it. Now I've been promoting it, but I'm just wondering, I know currently the advice is that you still need to, uh, um, uh, 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 observe social distancing on the site, but I just wondered, is there any view of when the household waste recenter, recycling centres might either withdraw the booking or open up? Thank you uh, for the question, Councillor Bradman, and Steve will give a detailed response in a few moments, but can I just say there's a challenge that we've put back to offices a few times um, in uh, chairs meetings, etc., about us reviewing it constantly. Um, but just to stress two comments before I bring in Steve. Number one is that the uh, absolute paramount importance or, or, or our first concern is both public safety and our officer safety. So we have to make sure that obviously the booking system was introduced to stop queuing traffic on our highways, which pre pre presented quite significant risk, um, but also to make sure social distancing is observed and, and guidance is followed. So um, that's why it was introduced. It certainly wasn't introduced um, uh, without uh, sort of uh, there was a certain amount of reluctance to do so. But we have to have to make sure that we do everything we can to make sure the household recycling centres are safe. So that's the first comment. And the second comment is to say that um, obviously I just wanted to make the public comment that um, dumping rubbish because you haven't booked a slot is illegal. And uh, and I hope that most people that are um, going to our household recycling centres aren't criminals. And, and we have I've heard this comment before about introducing charging that increase, increases fly tipping. And the comment back um, in the research is that by introducing charging or other preclusive elements to our household recycling, we don't generally create criminals. Um, and so I do hope that that's not going to be the case. I understand that some people's behavior does change as a result of frustration, et cetera. But I just wanted to place on pub public record and to anyone that would go to our recycling centers and be disappointed, it is illegal. And we will obviously use whatever um, evidence we have to find people that are caught by tipping. Steve, do you want to comment about the uh, booking systems? Chairman, just, just before, what I would say is, of course, that, that, that um, what tends to happen is that if it's in a public locality, the, the district council ends up going to collect it. But if it's on private land, the, the cost falls to the farmer to, yeah. to remove it. Absolutely. And, and, and nevertheless, it still is illegal whether it be dumped on private or public land. So, um, but yes, I, I appreciate the challenge. And it's something which we absolutely don't want to see an increase of fight. Steve. Yeah, Chair, I think you've, you've answered the questions and covered the points um, uh, that I was going to make. Um, so, so other than to stress that the, the reason that we have got the, the booking system is that the sites themselves have got to be safe for those visiting uh, and those um, uh, working at the sites. And we've, we're constantly getting advice from public health colleagues on social distancing and, and we're keeping it under review uh, every, every, almost every day, but certainly every week that there is a team, team that meets to, to see whether we can relax the booking systems uh, and how quickly we can do that. If there are aspects of the booking systems that are not working well enough, then we'll, we'll definitely take that, that away and, and make it better. I know there's been a few teething problems and there were in the first few, few days uh, of, of them uh, in some places, but if there are some, some issues, we will look at that and make it as easy as possible. We don't want people to be put off. We don't want the implications that you've alluded to to happen in terms of fly tipping illegal as it is as, as chair has, has rightly said um, but we've got to make it as easy as possible within the restrictions that we've got at the moment thank you very much i really appreciate that and again uh, our thanks to quentin and adam smith and the team who have been circulating updates to members very regularly so uh, that's very helpful councillor peter hudson just a quick one chair thank you it's to go back to counter to praise um issue about the raising traffic levels um, it's not surprising. I don't think we should get too excited about it yet. Um, highways, I'm sure, have a, a finger on the pulse. But the main issue, if one reads the report and look at your house windows, is that we've got out of we've got to get out of jail card from the fourth of July. And where I live this weekend, the, tra the traffic where I live is really, really very little. The small estate I live on, 
and over the weekend it was packed with cars and I was out there doing a bit of gardening, trimming the hedge or whatever and talking to my neighbours looking around and it's all pe people go to see their friends they haven't been able to see their friends and loved ones for months and months and months and all around my house was full of cars and it's all people rushing to see their friends so once everybody's seen their friends and calmed down a bit I'm sure that level will reduce but I don't think we should um, complain about people being allowed out to go see their friends after three or four months and not been able to thank you thank you Councillor Hudson and uh, yeah you make a very good point and um, uh, I'm not sure you weren't suggesting that after seeing them once they'll be sick of them and not need to go again uh, but um, the, 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 there is go naturally going to be a, a, a when when you when the lockdown becomes lessened uh, there's going to be influx and you can't take a moment snapshot of, of uh, changes it needs to be under sort of you know a system, systemic kind of approach of, of looking at it so uh, yes thank you very much members and I think we've commented on the COVID report and thank you very much Steve uh, for the report and we only asked to note and comment which I believe we've done so which moves on to our uh, next agenda item um, which is uh, the agenda item 11 the environment and sustainability committee agenda plan training plan and appointments to outside bodies and with the democratic services report any changes to the agenda plan since publication and James thank you James uh, thank you chair we've had um, a carbon valuation for business cases report has been added to the committee's agenda plan for September and the West Cambridge master plan responses report has been moved from September to November that's everything thank you Thank you very much, James. Members, any further comments on our agenda, plan, training plan, appointments to outside bodies? I look for any indications. Councillor Dupre. Thank you. Yes, I, I wanted to talk about just briefly the training plan um, because we have, there's very little indication in, in this in some instances as to what the desired learning outcomes or success measures are. There is a column for that and for a number of the entries, there is nothing against that. And I think that that is quite important to know. Um, the other issue I wanted to raise about this was that it's also important to know how these are to be delivered, um, particularly at this time, obviously, when the ability to meet face-to-face -face is constrained. But um, it is feasible, I suppose, that a decision could be made that one of these um, items, one of these subjects could be met by actually circulating a note. Um, and I just wanted to be clear that often circulating a note or a report or something is not the same as training. Um, and I wanted some, I, I think I want an additional column to say how these uh, items are actually going to be delivered to members and to be clear that if it's in a training plan, it is actually training. It's not just an extra three pages of, of, of email in our inbox. Thank you, I think it's a really good suggestion. I think, you know, it's something we wouldn't have to have done pre-COVID um, because we understood what training was, which would be a member's workshop or a seminar or something, but now we, we, we're, doing things slightly differently, I think it's a good suggestion that we identify how that training will be administered. Steve, perhaps you could take that away and, and, and introduce that as a, another column. Cheryl, you've indicated you wish to speak. Oh, um, yes, it was just to update on that training plan to say that um, we would like to, in August, bring forward um, a presentation to you on valuing carbon and also on the discussion around environmental implications and how we do that more strategically across the authority. Um, if everybody's okay that we plan that for August. And then we were looking at planning for the climate change action plan and energy program work for September, if that's okay. So moving it from July. I've noted the points that um, uh, Councillor Dupre made around outcomes and we'll get those looked at for our bits. Thank you very much. Um, just to be uh, 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 make you aware, uh, Cheryl, that obviously August is uh, a, a month um, which is difficult for some members, but I think it shouldn't stop us from, from scheduling something in. I'm sure uh, attendance will be as, as good as it can be. Um, but uh, I've got a note about our August meetings uh, in a few moments. Um, but I think we should still go ahead with trying to schedule in a training session, as you suggested. Councillor Bradman. It was on that point. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I note that we've all already got waste PFI overview 
and also how to respond to a consultation in August. So we've already got quite a lot going on in August. I'm just wondering, are we going to have time for, I mean, whilst I welcome Cheryl's uh, proposal, is, is that the right time to do it? The only reason for adding, so I think that there's two points. Uh, I, I take your point as well um, about uh, how long you want to be in a training session for. The valuing carbon, we were proposing to do a presentation ahead of the fact that we're bringing a committee report in September. And that has wider and broader implications around um, decision making, which I thought would be quite helpful for you. Um, and I think the environmental implications doesn't need to be long. It can be a relatively short session around how we want to more strategically influence on um, impacts on the environment. But um, I don't know, uh, Councillor Schumann, are you thinking that uh, that might add too much to that session? Uh, no, not. I, I, I don't have any specific concerns. I just, uh, I just want to flag up that I don't want to, to do a training session where attendance is potentially going to be compromised because it would undermine, you know, the very importance of what we want to do. Um, Steve, did you have a comment? I know you just indicated to speak. Yes, I thought. I thought um, just just to to look at August. Um, if we were to focus on the items that Cheryl uh, mentioned and also. The one around, I think it's the cons consultation responses. I think that's an important one for the committee also. Um, and, and if we if we set that out for for members as a as a plan or an agenda for that for that session, so that we're timing it and you can see what the purpose of them uh, of the training slots are, that would be helpful. I think for, for members ahead of ahead of that. And I think we would move the waste item into a later a later training one, uh, contain it to Thank those you. those two items. I think what this has flagged up is the need for us to perhaps circulate a bit more detailed training plan um, and I'll leave that with the officers to come back to us with a detailed training plan, how it will be delivered as Councillor Dupre suggested and also perhaps a suggestion of agenda and timings against them so that we know exactly what we're committing to. But um, I've got um, you know, Steve and Emma and Cheryl and I'm sure Quentin will be hearing this so, so between, the, between you you can hopefully circulate something to us following this meeting. Uh, Jan French, Councillor French. Uh, thank you Chairman. Um, having attended the Communities and Partnership meeting last Thursday, 2nd of July, um, my understanding that all meetings except the Community and Partnerships are cancelled for the whole of August. So Thank you very much. I'll come on to that in just a few moments on the date of our next meeting, but I think you're absolutely right to flag up that that was the intention, um, and I'll be reading just a few words about that. Um, Councillor Bradman, was that a hangover from... Sorry, it was a query about Sorry, I just, it's a bit detailed and I should have perhaps emailed Steve Cox to ask the question, but does that really mean how to respond to a consultation response? Or does it mean how to respond to a consultation? You're absolutely right, Councillor Bradman. It's, the wording isn't quite right. It's, there are major applications that we all know about that the committee will be asked to comment on. Uh, ah, and. Yeah for that purpose um but we'll get the wording yes. right the training plan round. <laughs> thank you it, it's thank you and it's interesting i think that you know the training is aimed at the members mainly and it's how we respond to a consultation response to make sure we're scrutinizing it it's, it's a yes. difficult one but uh, i'm sure again when the detail of that um training session is circulated all will become very clear thank you uh, cheryl again i've got a hand is that did you want to speak or is that just a, a hangover from that? um it's um, accidentally, I didn't turn it off. No, that's fine. No problem. Um, thank you very much. I just didn't want to miss you out. So th thank you. I think we've commented on the agenda plan and training plan and we'll, um, action is to, to from the officers to, to circulate an up-to-date training plan to members uh, with more details of timings and dates. Which brings us on to, well, that's the uh, end of all of our official agenda items, but just to the date of the next meeting. Uh, group leaders have agreed that the August meetings of the Council Policy and Service Committee, excluding the Health Committee, will be cancelled. Therefore, the next meeting of this committee will take place on the 17th of September 2020, and the arrangements for this meeting will be confirmed nearer the time in light of the emerging situation. Who knows, we may have a real face-to-face -face meeting as opposed to a Zoom virtual meeting, um, but that may be optimistic. However, we will use the 13th of August meeting date for a training session, and uh, arrangements for this session will be provided near the time as per our discussion. 
So I have nothing else to add now and but to pass on my thanks to you all. And uh, as always, thanks to James for providing me with my briefing note and script so I know that what to say and where and don't go off record or off track. Um, so thank you all and I will uh, wish you all a nice weekend and see you soon. Thank you. Bye everybody. <laughs>